So to recap our first video, um, the Kolmogorov complexity, uh, the theory of Kolmogorov complexity is really motivated with the, by the philosophical question of what it means for an object to be random. We discussed that uh, although we didn't have a formal definition, uh, the intuition um, that we have is that um, randomness corresponds to patternlessness or incompressibility, that strings are random if, if they can't be compressed or that they don't have patterns, exploitable patterns. Um, we, at the very end, gave a formal definition of the Kolmogorov complexity of a string. This is going to be the measuring tool that we use to calculate how random an object is, how random a string is. In this lecture, we're going to continue exploring this field. And to begin with, we're going to talk about the first pillar of Kolmogorov complexity, the existence of optimal machines. Okay. To begin, I'll make the following definition. We say that a Turing machine U is optimal. if for every Turing machine M, there is a constant C sub M depending only on M such that for every finite binary string X, the complexity of X with respect to U is at most the complexity of X with respect to M plus that constant. So the key point is that when we were discussing when we were introducing Kolmogorov complexity, trying to answer this question about what it means to be random, and then gave the definition of Kolmogorov complexity, it was, uh, you needed to specify a specific Turing machine. And you might feel a bit cheated about this definition because you think it's too, too brittle, fragile, right? It, it seems, um, it doesn't seem good to, to have the fundamental, prop, the fundamental definition depend so heavily on the choice of Turing machine. So you might have felt cheated about this. But in fact, one of the, the first pillar of Kolmogorov complexity, the existence of optimal machines, is showing that um, there's no reason to fret, that there is an optimal optimal machine, which essentially minimizes the complexity of, of any string. Okay. So before we get into this theorem, uh, I need to make a couple, uh, we, need to, we need to fix a couple things. The first is we need to fix a computable encoding of Turing machines. And by that, I mean, we need to be able, we need to fix a way to represent Turing machines as, bi as binary strings. The second thing 
before we get into the proof of, op, uh, of optimal machines is that we will fix a computable pairing function. Okay, so our pairing function will take in two strings x, y, and it will pair them together as follows. So x paired with y will have a prefix of the length of x many zeros, followed by a one, followed by x, followed by y. Okay. The essential property of this pairing function is that if you're given x paired with y, you can computably uh, compute x. So you can compute x and you can compute y. Okay. Namely, you simply uh, you simply read the bits from left to right. Um, you find the number of zeros, which gives you the length of the string x, compute x, and then finally compute y. Okay, so with these two items in place, we can get to the so-called invariance theorem. And so the invariance theorem simply states that there are optimal machines. That is, there are machines which um, minimize, additively minimize the complexity of all strings. Okay. For the proof of this, Let U be a universal Turing machine uh, such that for every Turing machine M and every finite binary string X, The universal Turing, this universal machine U on input M X, so M paired with X, simply simulates M on input X. Thus, the output of U on M X is equal to the output of M on input X. Of course, if M does not halt, on the input X, U doesn't halt either. Now I claim that U, this, this universal Turing machine U is optimal. To see this, let M be a Turing machine. Let C of M denote the constant two times the length of the encoding of M plus one. So again, we fixed a computable encoding of Turing machines. So we represent Turing machines as finite binary strings. But we take whatever the length of the representation of M is, add one and double it. Let X be a binary string 
and let pi be a binary string such that m on input pi eventually halts and outputs x. And the length of pi is equal to the complexity of x with respect to m. So these last two properties are very common in Kolmogorov complexity, and we have a we have a special word uh, to make this more concise. When a string pi satisfies these two properties, we say that pi testifies. to the complexity of x with respect to m. OK. So by the definition, of our universal Turing machine, U, if we give you this machine M paired with this input pi, it will simulate M on input pi. In other words, U on the input m paired with pi will eventually halt and output x. Therefore, the complexity of x with respect to u is at most the length of this input m paired with pi, which by our choice of pairing function is equal to zero, um, a prefix of zero of length m followed by a one, followed by the encoding of m, followed by pi. And we can calculate what this length actually is and it's equal to the length of pi plus two times the length of m plus one. In other words, it's equal to the length of pi plus our constant. And by definition, by our choice of pi, This is equal to the complexity of x with respect to m. And the proof is complete. So u is additively dominated by m. The complexity of any string with respect to u is at most the complexity of that string with respect to m plus a constant. Okay. So for the remainder of the lecture, we will fix this optimal machine U. And we will refer to the complexity of x with respect to u as v Kolmogorov complexity of x. We usually denote this as simply CX, we drop the subscript U as we fixed it.
Okay. So for the remainder of the lecture, I'm going to just assume that U has been fixed, our optimal machine machine has been fixed, and, and really uh, drop it from our subscripts. With that in mind, let's move on to a, a simple but surprisingly useful lemma. What this lemma says is that there is a constant C um, such that for every finite binary string, the complexity of X is at most the length of that string, the length of X, plus C. And it's important um, to note that the constant doesn't depend on, on, the, on the string. So there's a fixed constant uh, so that this inequality is true for every binary string X. To prove this lemma, let M be the identity Turing machine. That is, that M on any string W eventually halts. So, so that, uh, so M is the identity Turing machine, meaning that M on input W simply halts and outputs W. Therefore, the Kolmogorov complexity of any string X with respect to the identity Turing machine M is just the length of X. That is the shortest and only program which causes the identity machine to halt and output X. So by the invariance theorem, therefore, we have that the complexity of X is at most the complexity of X with respect to the identity machine plus some constant depending only on the, on the encoding of our machine. And this is just equal to the length of X plus that constant. So while this lemma is, is fairly straightforward, uh, there's a couple of nice properties. The first is that the Kolmogorov complexity of any string exists. Um, there's an upper bound, uh, which is simply the length of that string. So it's surprisingly useful. The other um, property of this lemma that, that that's, comes up again and again is that it really uh, highlights the structure of a lot of these proofs. So when you're upper bounding the complexity, the Kolmogorov complexity of a string, typically what you want to do is to define a Turing machine which exploits a certain property of that of the string. Okay. Um, once you come up with a machine that does that, uh, you bound the complexity of the string with respect to that machine, and then you complete the proof uh, by appealing to the invariance theorem. So this happens a lot. For another example, um, for another example,
we have the following lemma. Let A be some subset of the set of all binary strings. So we have a set of binary strings, which is decidable. Then there is a constant C such that the complexity of X is upper bounded by the log of a n plus two of the log of m plus c for every x in a n where a n is the set of X of the strings in A of length N. Okay, so if you have any decidable set and you have some string uh, in that set, some string X, the complexity of that string is upper bounded by the total cardinality of all the strings in that set of length N plus two times log of n plus the constant, okay? Proof. So the proof of this lemma follows a lot of the same form as the previous. We begin by defining a Turing machine which exploits the property um, that we care about. In this case, the fact that the string is a member of a decidable set. So let M be the Turing machine defined by this. M Given input n paired with m is going to output the mth string, okay, the mth string of length n in standard order. So just fix the standard lexicographical ordering of strings. M is going to output the nth string of a n um, okay if possible if there is an nth string of length n and otherwise it's just going to output some dummy string let's call it zero Let X be a member of A of length N. So X is in AN. And let M be the index of X in AN. That is, X is the mth string of length N in A. Then, by definition, then by definition, the complexity of X with respect to M, sorry, then M given N and M pulse and outputs X. 
Therefore, the complexity the complexity of x with respect to m is less than or equal to the length of n paired with m by our choice of our pairing function that's just equal to the length of n zeros followed by a one followed by the binary string representation of m of n followed by the binary string representation of m therefore this is equal to 2 times log base 2 log base 2 of n which is the length of the binary representation of n plus log base 2 of m so we again conclude by the invariance theorem that we therefore conclude by the invariance theorem that the complexity of X is upper bounded by the complexity of X with respect to this machine M plus a constant. And we just calculated that this in turn is upper bounded by two times the log of N plus one plus the log of m plus this constant okay which is equal to 2 times log of n plus log of m plus some constant So this holds for every single string in A. To conclude the theorem, we simply note that the size of A, the, the, the index of X in A, in AN, is at most the size of AN. In other words, this is upper bounded by the size of a n. Okay. So this is also a very useful lemma because it relates the complexity of a string with the size of decidable sets which contain it. So if you have a decidable set that's very sparse, the elements of that set must have low complexity. 